The title of this presentation is Ageless Challenges and Exploring the Effects of Iron Deficiency in the Elderly. And as much as this was the initial title and, you know, one's not allowed to change these things, I think that one, when you're thinking about this um, topic, don't think about elderly as, you know, old grannies in walkers, but think about it in older adults. Um, so many of us, well, me not quite yet, but a lot of us are actually getting to the stage that we are um, older adults. And so people over 60 or 65, depending on where um, we, you know, how we define it. But it's it's not only in the, you know, the very old um, people that we're going to be talking about. We're going to be looking at the older adults in general. So um, these are my disclosures. And I think the... The most important one is that these are, are my own opinions, but wherever I've said something, it's substantiated by what I've read in the literature. And you will find um, in the um, nice uh, handout that ANOVA has prepared that I've put in all the references there. So as much as the references are not going to be very dense in the presentation, you will find the references in that handout. But secondly, um, these are, <laughs> are opinions that are um, fueled by passion as well, as much as they are also fueled by data. So I'm not neutral about iron deficiency, and, and I really believe that this is a grossly overlooked public health concern. And then I have previously had speaker on our area from a couple of companies related to iron. So we're going to just have a look at um, this talk in th three basic um, sessions. The first is going to be looking at the burden of iron deficiency in older adults. And we're going to have a couple of words about why it happens in the first place. And then, so with that, um, we're going to then step over to the five M's um, in um, older adult care or geriatric care and iron deficiency. And, and these, I'm going to introduce these five concepts to you, which is the mind, the mobility, multi-complexity, medication, and what matters most in managing the older patient. And there we're going to explore how iron deficiency um, actually either makes things worse or more complicated in each of those um, areas of the five M's. And then to wrap up, we're going to look at some practical pointers and how we can go and apply this in our practice when we finished with this um, presentation. So um, we're going to start by looking at the burden of anemia and iron deficiency. So just to kick off, I think it is important to realize and, and to be critical when you're reading articles, because remember, anemia can occur with or without iron deficiency, but also iron deficiency can occur with or without anemia. So one's got to, you know, be very careful how you read and interpret articles. You know, you can't just sort of jump in and say, uh, you know, all anemia is iron deficiency or all iron deficiency is anemia. And so we're going to, you know, have to, um, I'll, and I'll tease some of those things out as we talk. But most of the times, the two are very much intertwined. And we know that anemia um, is usually caused by iron deficiency, or at least um, in up to 50% of times in, in the general population. Okay, but just to kick off and, and to look from the South African perspective. So this is um, data from 2022 where we can see that the elderly population in South Africa makes up, a, you know, a smallish um, percentage of 9.2% of, you know, our, our total population. It's made up predominantly of females. Um, and this is now all people older than 60. So not, you know, the particularly old, but just older than 60. But what we can see in the trends, um, if you look at the, the, the figure in the left-hand side, uh, excuse me, in the right-hand side, you can see year on year, the um, prevalence or the proportion of the population that is made up by older people is actually increasing all the time. So we've seen, and I think that this is an indicator that um, access to healthcare is maybe better and that our people are living a bit longer. But it also becomes important because we this makes up a bigger proportion of the patients that we see. What is concerning is that um, in, nationally, only 16% of the population are actually on a medical aid, which is which is really small. But interestingly, many people um, that are older, are, almost a quarter of them, are actually on a medical aid scheme. So they should be able to come and access private health care. And this is just a reminder that they are almost better um, represented in the medical health care scheme and 
that we should be giving them a service and, and looking after them. What is disappointing, and it's not the purpose of this talk, but is looking at racial um, differences between these, and, and, and still this is very much underrepresented by the African population, and, and it's, this, this number is predominantly um, European ancestry people. But the point is, is that a large number of um, older people do have medical aids and should have um, access to private um, care. So we see that anemia um, is, is, is a global um, thing. And if, after all these lectures, you're not convinced about that, um, <laughs> I think you're going to have to go back and listen again. But what we see is that the prevalence of anemia actually increases the older that you get. So the prevalence is increasing. Um, and I think as much as it is normal to be well, to, to notice this trend, and this is not a South African thing, but all over, that the prevalence of anemia increases with age. We should not assume that this is a normal sort of um, phenomenon in aging. We, we need to look for an underlying cause of anemia. And up to 80% of patients um, with anemia, you will be able to find an underlying cause. So please don't just say, oh, this granny's old and you know that there's nothing more to do. We, we need to look for the causes. And in general, in, in older patients, you can divide this up into thirds. So one third is a pure nutritional deficiency. And that obviously is iron, but it could also be B12, but it could also be folate. There's interesting interplays with vitamin D and, and other, um, like copper as well there, but nutritional deficiencies. And we'll talk about that also in a little bit of detail later on. A third is related to the older person sort of getting older and now developing um, decreased renal, uh, renal function or other organ function, but um, predominantly chronic kidney disease. And then also the inflammatory process that um, is associated with aging. So anemia of chronic disease or anemia of inflammation, as it's now called. So a third of those of anemic patients will have that as an etiology. And then a third will have myelodysplastic syndrome or other myelodysplasia with overlap of some of these other um, conditions. So, so that's sort of where we're at. So I'm saying this up front because I don't want to overemphasize the role of iron deficiency in the older patient. So we need to think about it, but we must remember that this patient might have other reasons as well. And commonly might have more than one pathology. So one needs to do a, a rigorous investigation of the anemic or the patient. So where do we start? I think as with any patient, and um, we need to start with a good history. And we need to start with a bleeding history. And that, that bleeding history should not just be, you know, are you a heavy bleeder? But to get a better history of how did this patient, um, you know, and most of these patients, you know, especially the women are, are postmenopausal, but ask them how the um, periods were when they were still menstruating. Was there any, um, you know, abnormal vaginal bleeding? And in the older patient, this, this might then also be relevant um, with cervix cancer that might be bleeding, gastrointestinal malignancies. And, and to take time to, to look for occult, well, not, it might not even be occult, but unreported bleeding in these patients. The second is to, to explore malabsorption as a cause of anemia. So we know that um, these patients might have had gastrointestinal surgery. Um, maybe they, when they were younger, they might have had bariatric surgery or other um, reasons for having gastrointestinal surgery that might um, affect their absorption. There might be, and a lot of people, especially after COVID, I've noticed an increase in zinc supplementation, but that decreases your copper absorption and then can re um, result in anemia as well. We should not forget about um, the older people who are not coping on their pensions and that they are not, um, you know, that they don't have a, a, a nice um, mixed diet anymore. And, and then anorexia, which is also not uncommon in the, in the older patients. You know, we think of it as a teenager problem, but, um, but in older patients, anorexia nervosa can also occur. And this causes gelatinous changes in the bone marrow, which can certainly then also result in anemia. And then we need to explore and think about the underlying systemic illnesses that, that you might find in, in the older patients. So do they have an underlying malignancy? Have they got chronic kidney disease, heart failure, any other rheumatological conditions that might have a chronic inflammatory um, component, obviously then with an increase in hepcidin and subsequently decreased iron absorption. Um, sort of um, endocrine 
senility in a way, you know, hypothyroidism, androgen deficiency, adrenal insufficiency, and this can also then re result in anemia. Um, chronic infections like um, chronic um, urinary tract infections can also then affect your iron absorption. But the other thing, and why I've put that calendar there as a reminder, is how long has this anemia been there? You know, is this that this patient's been seeing me for a couple of years and the HP's always been a little bit low-ish? Or has something changed drastically? Because that's going to also affect your decision-making on, on how, um, you know, urgently you need to jump in as well. I'm not saying that the person with a chronic anemia, you should not investigate urgently. But if you see a sudden change in the hemoglobin, you need to be a little bit more aggressive um, in your approach to that anemic patient. And then we need to talk about the older patient and medication. Um, so when you go into the history, I think it is important, especially if it's a new patient that you're seeing, has this patient ever um, received a, a transfusion before? And, and this would help you to understand, is this, is this a chronic anemia? What am I prescribing for this patient? Is this patient taking what I'm prescribing? Is this patient maybe just sort of have had iron supplementation perhaps prescribed but not taking it? Um, what is over-the-counter stuff is a patient buying him or herself and which might then affect the um, absorption of the, the other medication that you're giving. And then don't forget about traditional complementary and alternative medications or TCAMs that then um, might also relate to anemia. So a thorough medi medication history is, is also required in these patients. So um, a study that was done actually at our institution about 10 years ago showed that in geriatric inpatients, almost 60% of the patients with anemia were not even investigated. So this is something that's not unique to our hospital. In fact, we, we see it um, all over the place that, that um, patients are not investigated um, sufficiently for their anemia. So please don't miss the opportunity to investigate that patient when they are anemic. But, um, and this is quite a nice practical approach. So everybody who is older than 60 with anemia, you start with four main um, things. The first is that you need a kidney function. And interestingly, you don't need to have chronic kidney failure to um, be anemic. Anybody with a GFR of less than 45, um, that, that, that chronic kidney disease may contribute to the anemia. You need to do iron studies, but don't forget about B12 and folate and screen for that. Um, and we're noticing more folate um, deficiency and I think food fortification programs are not that successful. Then um, don't forget about other um, causes if those are, are normal, monoclonal gammopathy or MGUS, smoldering myeloma, myeloma, well, actually, it, it would not be um, smoldering, or <laughs> it would be myeloma. And think about that when you see the MCV is raised, especially in the context of a low um, GFR with a high calcium. So, so think about these things. Think about androgen deficiencies and then also myelodysplastic syndrome and other clonal bone marrow disorders. Um, so I put this slide in because cancer, you know, the, the prevalence or the risk of getting cancer increases as you get older. And very often we sort of do a very cursory um, cancer screen and, you know, we'll just go and do a gastroscopy and a colonoscopy. But we don't think deeper as other um, cancer related causes um, of anemia. So obviously intraluminal bleeding is what we're looking for when we do a gastroscopy and a colonoscopy. But um, cancer can um, cause anemia in many different ways. You might, the tumor itself might be bleeding, like if you think about um, a cervix cancer, for example. Then also um, you might have, you know, bone marrow infiltration that causes thrombocytopenia, so you're bleeding from other um, reasons as well. Um, obviously, the, the nutritional deficiencies with cancer, we are not eating nicely, might also then aggravate um, the the anemia that's related to cancer. So what I'm trying to say here is that even if I know that this patient's got cancer, there might be other reasons why that, you, you know, nothing stops this patient from having cancer plus an iron deficiency. Hemophagocytosis, which is something that you'll see on the bone marrow or other bone marrow infiltrates. But you might also have indirect causes, you know, sort of perineoplastic features um, that you, that you may, or, you know, in, other reasons why 
in cancer patients, they might also be anemic as amyloid deposition in the bone marrow or even in the kidneys, hemolysis, this chronic inflammation that you get um, with cancer, and then pure red cell aplasia that may, that may accompany thymomas or hematological malignancies. And then obviously the treatment um, for the cancer can also make you anemic. So these are things that we need to consider in the older patient. So you need to think further than just, uh, you know, is this iron deficiency and sort of step out. You, you need to think, is this patient um, maybe hemolyzing? Is, it, is there bleeding as well? Um, then just a word, and we're going to talk about the red flags um, when we look at the investigation and the pathways for investigation. But if this patient has got a pancytopenia, what I mean by that is that the, the patient does not only have anemia, but has got an associated um, low platelets and an associated um, low white cell count, you need to um, be more thorough um, in your investigation. And, and you need, now need to go and explore drug causes, um, infections, bone marrow failure. And for that, you're going to need to do a bone marrow um, aspirate and biopsy, which might re reveal myelodysplastic syndrome, myelofibrosis, hematological malignancies, and other um, clonal disorders. Hypersplenism um, should also be considered in patients with pancytopenia, autoimmune conditions, um, hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis and thrombotic uh, microangiopathies should also be considered. So this is going to be in a very small group of patients, but don't be so focused on only the anemia. If, if there's more than one cell line um, down, you need to think that this is something more sinister and, and needs further investigation. So um, in that same study that looked at um, anemia in geriatric inpatients, almost a quarter of anemic uh, geriatric inpatients have iron deficiency as, as the cause of the anemia. But remember that iron deficiency anemia might only be a drop in the anemia bucket. And what I'm trying to say there is that, yes, this patient might have iron deficiency and iron deficiency might contribute to the anemia, but perhaps there are other reasons that need to be investigated. But on the flip side, many patients might have iron deficiency without having anemia. And one needs to just keep iron deficiency as top of mind um, and not wait for this patient to be anemic. So why do older people get um, iron deficiency? So many old people live alone and they don't they're not really very adventurous with their diets they might be you know going to spa and buying the meal of the day there which is pretty devoid of um, most <laughs> nutrients and i mean if they i've seen so many and heard of so many older people that buy the meal of the day and break that meal of the day up into four little quarters and eat on it for four days so they've but um, they've got a really monotonous and unadventurous diet and often devoid of good nutrients many are institutionalized and you know they, they don't have a fridge in their little room anymore so they only eat what's given to them and often i mean we know that the cost of institutionalization is extremely high for older people so they you know they and they also cutting and working on a budget so often the food is also not um, great there as we get older, our appetites decrease, our smell and taste is also not as acute as before. And, you know, food is not that exciting anymore. De decreased gastric emptying and um, colonic emptying as well. You know, people feel fuller for longer. Occult blood loss is maybe not even noticed, and that's what occult means. And then inflammation. And we're going to talk about frailty and how that is a risk um, or a cause of inflammation. And then decreased absorption, which is often associated with infl inflammation, but also, you know, bile, uh, bile um, edema that then decreases your absorption as well. So what is frailty? Um, so I'm not a geriatrician, and I'm sorry that I've spelled frailty with two eyes there, but frailty is something that I think has always fascinated me. It's a state of increased vulnerability resulting from age-associated declines in reserve and function across multiple physiological systems that, um, such that the ability to cope with everyday or acute stresses is compromised. And, and this is, you know, something that is often sort of considered normal. However, frailty is definitely not normal. And it's associated with exhaustion, 
poor or weak grip strength, slow walking speed, unintentional weight loss, and then low physical activity. So it's a pentad of five main um, symptoms. And here we can see that there are a couple of things, or 10 main factors um, with frailty. And I'm so sorry for the double I and frailty is driving me nuts. Um, but so on the one side, we've got aging, where we've got a physi physiological decline, just, you know, normal organ um, aging. But the organ might age to such an extent that there's now organ dysfunction, cellular aging, mitochondria, um, you know, is not working quite as well as it always did. So therefore, decrease ATP production um, and cellular repair is also not as, as good as it used to be. And then this um, second concept is called inflammaging. So as we age, our, um, we, we get inflammation with the aging process. And that's demonstrated by sort of high, higher levels of interleukin-6 and CRP. And you'll remember from our previous lectures is that when I've got inflammation, hepcidin increases and my iron absorption is, is decreased. Additionally, we've got sarcopenia, which is really just muscle wasting. So as we, we develop muscle apoptosis with aging. And interestingly, there's, there's interesting data that looks at iron deficiency as a signal for sarcopenia and iron deficiency actually turning on muscle apoptosis. So this sarcopenia then results in decreased physical activity, but this then spirals as well. So the, the, the poorer my muscle mass is, the less physical activity I do, and therefore I become more sarcopenic, and, and this then becomes worse and worse and worse. And then this results in changes in hormone um, hormones, and then also increased adiposity, which then has got other endocrine, endocrine um, consequences. And then... Um, Often um, this poor protein diet that, that people are eating also then um, leads into the sarcopenia. So nutritional deficiencies play into that as well. Physical inactivity builds, you know, so all of these things start um, cycling. Chronic conditions, so heart disease, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, arthritis, COPD, obesity. Please don't forget about that. that this is an inflammatory condition. And then depression also has got a... Um, a, a, a strong association with frailty as well. We, we've alluded to the hormonal changes, so decreased sex hormones, specifically testosterone, growth hormone, and insulin growth factor one also um, decrease with aging. Cognitive decline then also increases your fall risk. You've got reduced mobi uh, mobility and poor self-care. And then this then builds into nutritional deficiencies and then physical activity, worsening the sarcopenia and then worsening the, the, the inflama inflammatory process as well. And this then is in the environment of somebody who's perhaps isolated and lonely, not eating well. Um, there's a strong association with um, smoking and frailty, poverty, um, interestingly, having a depressed partner is a risk for um, frailty um, and then access to care as well. And then uh, female patients, that little, um, oh, I don't know why I put X, why they're sorry, or oh, double X, I think it cut off there, but yeah, so, so being a female is also a risk for um, frailty. So what is the impact of iron deficiency in older adults? And here um, we're going to talk about the five M's of geriatric care. So the first is um, multi-complexity. So we know that, you know, we, when, when you see an older patient, you, you it's never just hypertension, is it? You know, it, it's hypertension with diabetes, with heart failure, touch of chronic kidney disease, you know, gastroesophageal reflux, and probably some osteoporosis as well. And, you know, then they also on some NSAIDs for the, um, osteoarthritis as well. So we know that these are complex patients with loads of different problems and, and often all of these problems also treated um, and, and these you know two M's of medications and multi-complexity often um, spiral as well. So with the geriatric syndromes we'll you know that we know psychosocial needs um, you know it becomes quite intricate to look after these patients. And often this results in extremely long co consultations and and I mean, if we're really honest with ourselves, they're, they're often exhausting consultations. And, you know, some, I think that sometimes the last thing we think about is I wonder what, 
you know, this lady's eyes and, you know, because we're so busy sorting out all these acute needs and sorting out the chronic um, or repeat prescription, which by itself is a page and a half, you know, so so we, we don't um, necessarily pay attention to each of the, the problems even without looking for new ones. And then mobility is, is a big problem in, in geriatric patients. So frailty, we've spoken about falls, and we're going to explore how iron deficiency relates to falls and then to function. Medications, we'll um, talk about polypharmacy, how we can look at de-prescribing or reducing medication, optimal prescribing, and then importantly, side effects. Um, then the mind is the next M of geriatric care. You know, how do... Is it your mentation, dementia, delirium, and depression? And we'll um, look at how iron actually plays a role in that. And then here at the last little bit, we can't really fix this with iron, or I don't think iron really um, plays much into what matters most. But, um, but we'll talk about what the goals of care are in the matters most part of the M. Okay, so let's start with the mind. So... Um, so we know that with iron deficiency, people, I mean, and, and whether you're old or young, and, and I know that we, we, there's been a specific session on this, but brain fog is not uncommon with iron deficiency. We, studies have shown that people are more absent-minded and poorer cognitive function. And this then has got an impaired memory. So you don't need to have dementia to have poor mentation. So, but we do know that a low ferritin has got a poorer cognitive um, function and fixing that would certainly improve the mentation um, of, of an older person. While delirium is complex, we know that delirium is associated with the mortality risk. Interestingly, anemia is an independent risk factor for delirium, as is iron deficiency, as is transfusion. So these um, three all together are um, addition, you know, cumulative risks then um, for delirium. And this makes com the treating the elderly patient, and the, for those of you who work in hospitals, there's nothing more um, dissatisfying than when your older patient has um, delirium when they're admitted into hospital. Then dementia is associated both, and, and poorer um, Many mental state examinations are associated both with iron deficiency and anemia as well as with iron deficiency. So whether you're anemic or not, um, you, you have a poorer MMSC. So, and interestingly, when you treat those patients with iron therapy, their MMSE actually gets better, whether they were anemic or not anemic. So for here, this is, this is the flag to not only start screening for iron deficiency in the patient who's anemic, but we need to start thinking of screening for iron deficiency, even when the patient is not anemic, because uh, iron is so much more than just hemoglobin. And then like, also depression is, is multifactorial, but iron deficiency in, in older people is definitely associated with depression as well. So mobility. So iron deficiency is associated with increased expression of genes that relate to muscle atrophy, apoptosis, and autophagy. So <laughs> that's really scary for me. So, and for your older person who where sarcopenia is already on the cards, you know, we, we know that this is probably going to happen in any case. Why would we do something that's going to affect the mobility of our older patient? Oh, iron deficiency also switches our metabolism from aerobic to anaerobic. So this, you know, poor older person who's already riddled, and not all of them are riddled, but that have already, you know, struggling multi-complexity and lo lots of problems. Often the mobility is the thing that is very much related to the independence as well. So one should, one should protect that as far as possible. So we know that frailty is related to anemia, and the more anemic you are, the more frail um, the patients become. So we, we need to not just, just say, oh, well, you know, she's old, therefore anemia is okay. We need to treat and investigate that anemia to prevent frailty. Or And remember, frailty is not binary, you know, either I've got it or I don't, but there are degrees of frailty as well. And we want to prolong or 
make sure that this patient does not become frail or delay the onset of frailty for as long as possible. Frailty is related to the um, older adult's iron status as well. So frailty is related to falls, is related to hospitalization, disability placement, you know, so it takes them out of their home and into an institution. It's related to risk of death as well as to dementia. So we want to avoid frailty at all times. So there's conflicting data whether anemia is related to falls in older adults or not. Um, but we do know that iron deficiency is related to balance, low extremity strength and functional capacity. So I think that applying a good dose of common sense says that, um, you know, it's sort of like that parachute study. If, if I, you know, seeing there's no randomized controlled study to say that I need a parachute to stay safe when I jump out of an aeroplane. You know, a bit of common sense is that open your parachute so that you don't fall to your death. And, and I think falls... With, you know, even though there might be not be robust data to say that um, anemia is related to falls. I mean, if you think about it, if you're anemic, often the patients have got orthostatic hypertension. And, and, and for me, logically, um, it, it would relate to falls, but I, I can't quote you on any data on that. And the, well, there's conflicting data. Then function. So we know that there's an inverse relationship between iron deficiency muscle mass and hand grip strength and and these are two parts that very much relate back into frailty so we want to maintain muscle mass and hand grip strength is actually one of the the metrics that we um, use to measure or to diagnose um, frailty so the more iron deficient you the patient is the more or the less the muscle mass is and the less the hand grip strength is but what i found really interesting is that Iron deficiency is also associated with inspiratory muscle weakness. So irrespective of what the hand grip strength was or what the muscle um, mass was, the, the inspiratory muscles were weaker. So if you think, um, you know, I, I remember when I was very young in the whole medical game, you know, we were told that pneumonia is the old man's friend. And but now you've got somebody who has got pneumonia and maybe that they don't really want to welcome that friend of, you know, now I've got pneumonia and I'm going to, you know, not survive it. But having de re reduced inspiratory muscle strength actually has got an impact on how I'm going to tolerate my pneumonia and, and how I'm going to get better from that as well. So iron deficiency for me has, has got a lot to do with how not only my mobility in terms of musculoskeletal muscles, but um, also perhaps on, um, on my inspiratory muscles. And what I didn't put in here is how iron deficiency and heart failure interact. I know that there was a whole lecture on that, but this is, I mean, who gets heart failure? It's our older patients as well. So, and heart failure also speaks into mobility again. So, so the interplay is, is very intricate. Then um, for osteoporosis, we know that, and so I've, I've linked these two with mobility because I think that they, they do, as much as this is not what the textbooks say, I've sort of brought this in. So we know that um, iron is very important with collagen, in collagen synthesis and interestingly in vitamin D metabolism as well. But, you know, the two feed each other. So I need iron for my vitamin D metabolism, but I also need vitamin D to um, maintain my, my iron absorption. So the two are very um, important to each other. And we need to make sure that we don't focus only on one and not the other in, when we're considering how we're going to treat osteoporosis. So iron deficiency anemia seems to relate um, with osteoporosis. And patients with iron deficiency have got double the risk of developing osteoporosis compared to those that don't. So if, if I think of my mom <laughs> who's um, got osteoporosis, the, the, the idea of having osteoporosis completely freaks her out. And it's made me afraid of getting osteoporosis. So if I looked at this data and said, well, Claire, if you prevent or getting iron deficiency, you reduce your risk of getting osteoporosis by half if I'm taking taking this inversely, I'd say, well, gosh, let me let me check my iron studies and and make sure that I don't um, become iron deficient so that I don't have this doubled risk of getting osteoporosis. 
So then iron deficiency obviously re often re results in anemia. So the severity of anemia is associated with worse osteoporosis. Um, we know that low dietary iron is a risk for low bone mineral density. So this comes back to you know poor um, diets in, in the elderly. And interestingly, dietary iron may be protective against bone loss in postmenopausal women. So these um, are very important to consider the, the whole picture and that we, we should be looking to um, preserve bone mass as much as possible in all patients, not only in women. Then the second um, thing that can affect your mobility is, is stroke. So this data, I want to, I want to sort of caution you that it's, it's very sort of putting a lot of little loose ideas together. But iron deficiency seems to be, <laughs> and, and it's not a strong um, scene, but, but there is some sort of indication that iron deficiency might be related to an increased risk of thrombosis. So the first is that um, you get thrombocytosis with iron deficiency, and that, that's that, that I don't need to convince anybody about. You know, often we'll give that to, to a student even in the exams, you know, low HB, low MCV, and a high platelet count. What's that? That's iron deficiency. But there seems to be increased thrombin activity in iron deficient patients that leads to a hypercoagulability state. And there's a couple of case studies where in young people with strokes, and that the only risk factor that they could find for this young stroke was iron deficiency. So this is somewhere where we need to explore a little bit more, but there seems to be some association with stroke. So there is data that says 48% of patients with an acute stroke have got iron deficiency. And interestingly, a year later, that goes up by, by 50%. So from half of the patients having um, iron deficiency with acute stroke, three quarters have iron deficiency a year later. So don't only think about it when this patient comes into the hospital, but a year later, recheck that, that iron studies and uh, th those iron studies and if necessary, um, treat that. So hand grip strength, which is something a metric that we keep talking about, but hand grip strength is lower in those with iron deficiency compared to those without iron deficiency. And this is in stroke patients. And um, they, they looked at stroke patients and those that improved their hand grip strength, uh, you know, over time um, that were iron replete. But those that had iron deficiency did not improve their hand grip strength over time after their stroke. So for me, this is an indicator that even if, if we say, well, okay, the, the, you know, I'm grasping at straws saying that iron deficiency might be a cause of stroke, but we can say that if for that stroke patient, if that a patient that does not have iron deficiency compared to those that do have iron deficiency, that they'll actually do better and improve the hand grip strength if I don't have iron deficiency. I'd say, well, why are we not um, treating it and, 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 you know, making sure that this patient is not one of those three quarters that have iron deficiency a year after stroke and rather jump in and monitor it and treat it so that this patient's rehabilitation can be more successful. So the functional outcome after stroke is better in those without iron deficiency. So we should be testing and treating. So medications I and mean, iron deficiency is, is something that does become a little bit complicated. So this is the third M that we're talking about. I think polypharmacy, there's lots that can be said about polypharmacy, but we've already spoken about um, osteoporosis and, you know, and a lot of patients sort of get um, conflicting ideas and they're taking a calcium supplement for their bones and then they're taking an iron supplement for their blood, but never the two shall meet. So please, if they're going to be taking their calcium supplements, they should maybe take it in the morning and the iron supplement at night time. So don't, don't put those two at the same time, other, otherwise um, the iron's not going to absorb nicely. Then in terms of de-prescribing, I'm not going to um, try and convince you to change your prescriptions. Um, that, that would be a whole talk all by itself. But I think in terms of making treatment for of iron deficiency easier we should not be giving iron replacement more than once a day if you if this patient has got limited resources and that the only thing that they can afford is iron sulfate or ferrous sulfate we, the, that patient should take alternate daily dosing so every other day um, and then if you're taking um, other you know endosomal irons 
you can actually take that every day. You don't need to take um, sort of the more sophisticated ions every other day. You can take them every single day. However, some patients might have gastrointestinal side effects and then you can, can make it every other day. The message here is make the dosing schedule easy and do everything that you can to prevent um, side effects so that your compliance can be better. Then, in terms of optimal prescribing, um, patients that are on any of the thyroid hormones, any of the oral bisphosphonates, Parkinson's meds, and then certain antibiotics, so um, specifically the tetracyclines and the quinolones, those um, drugs should not be taken at the same time as your iron supplement because um, the iron will then bind onto these drugs and they are not going to be absorbed nicely. So, I mean, that this would be a tra tragedy, for instance, if the bisphosphonates are not absorbing or your altroxins not absorbing or your Parkinson meds. So because this then affects your mobility again or whatever, you know, your endocrine failure as well. So please think about the timing of when I give my, give my iron um, supplements and the other medications. This is not a contraindication to giving iron supplementation. And that, that's important. You just need to wait two hours between giving your, you know, between giving iron and um, the other medication. And, and that's why I'd, I'd probably just split them and give one, you know, in the morning, maybe your thyroid hormone and your bisphosphonates, for instance, and at lunchtime, let, them, let the patient take their um, oral iron. Then obviously PPIs also reduce the absorption of iron. So again, perhaps if you took your PPI in the morning, um, it, it might be better to take your iron in the afternoon or in the evening then. Then, um, in terms of side effects, this is a big thing with, with older patients. Um, select an iron preparation that's got the fewest gastrointestinal side effects. And I really um, encourage you to, to speak to Adele or any other members of the team looking at um, gastrointestinal side effects of, of the different drugs, drugs. And then, importantly, in your older patient, you need to look at how this iron that I have selected for my patient absorbs. And you, there are different ways that iron absorb. The one is transcellular, another one is paracellular. And, and we need to make sure that hepcidin does not affect the absorption of iron. So, in, for instance, just if we use the ordinary ferrous sulfate that, that we all know, that absorption will definitely be reduced when, when hepcidin is increased. So we need to be a little bit clever and perhaps spend a little bit more money and, and select an iron that is actually going to absorb so that I get the clinical benefit and not only the gastrointestinal um, side effects. Um, so this multi-complexity, I think, does make iron difficult. Uh, the, the diagnosis is not so straightforward. We've spoken about inflammation. We've spoken about all these things that, that make it difficult to diagnose iron deficiency um, in, in older patients. And, and just to reiterate that iron deficiency is not always top of mind or, or your top priority um, for these patients, but I just want to sort of bring it to the top of your mind. And the other thing is that we mustn't forget about the biopsychosocial complexities of treating an older patient, even if they've got a medical aid. You know, they, they're concerned about what is the cost of this iron test. And that's not just the cost of the test. For many patients, it's how do I get to the lab? How do I need to take somebody with me to the lab? That person is now not going to get their income. They've only got a very, very, very small pension. Um, you know, perhaps they've got to pay for public transport. And there are so many competing costs. And then the long consultations. And often we just want to sort of um, move the older person out of the office because the consultation has been so long. But but these these are things that, that make it more complicated to pick up this than, for instance, in a young, fit, healthy sportsman. But please don't forget about iron and don't let these complexities be an, an, an unnecessary barrier to, um, to treating um, for iron deficiency or screening for iron deficiency. So what matters most? Um, and this, this I like to say that the goal of care is a quality of life. And there's good data to say that iron deficiency is associated with a reduced health-related quality of life especially in elder patients. Iron deficiency is related to fatigue and it affects the functional capacity and recovery in older hospitalized patients. Body pain, general health, vitality, social function, and the emotional role 
actually improves when you treat iron deficiency. And that is parenterally, um, unfortunately, um, but but still, but but these all improve when, when this is um when this is when iron deficiency is treated. So it indicates a significant role for iron replacement therapy in improving the quality of life in older adults. So what, the reason why I say it's, it's unfortunate that the study was only done in parenteral iron is that for many patients, parenteral iron is still um, prohibitively expensive. And I, I'm not saying that parenteral iron is not good. I'm, I'm a huge, I, I very much believe in parenteral iron, but I think we need data to see what we can do with oral iron as well. So to wrap up, um, we need to go back to what is um, guidance um, from our international colleagues. So this is an article that was published um, earlier this year that looks at the recommendations for diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of iron deficiency, as well as iron deficiency anemia from EHA. And here they um, speak about screening for iron deficiency, and they've got a long list of, of um, different people that need to be screened. But note there that they say older adults, especially those with chronic kidney disease and chronic heart failure must be screened for iron deficiency. So what we don't need to wait for them to become anemic. We need to think about it and to screen these patients. Patients that are on medications like anticoagulants, antiplatelet drugs, and proton pump inhibitors are, are named specifically in the group that need to be screened. And they've got quite a nice um, guidance. And, and I really, the, the, this um, article is open access, so you won't have any um, struggle to get hold of it. But they have got a, a diagnosis algorithm, both for NAID, which is non-anemic iron deficiency. And then the next one that I'm going to show you is for iron deficiency anemia. So here, um, I think the important thing here is that the hemoglobin is normal. So the message that I want to give you is don't wait until the HP is low. So we need to screen for anemia in elderly patients and especially elderly patients who are on um, and, you know, anticoagulants, antiplatelet drugs or um, PPIs. We need to, actually all older patients, but especially those we need to think of it even before they are anemic. Um, if this um, serum ferritin is up until 100, so it depends, you know, here they say that we, we need to look at the ESR, and we need to look at the CRP to establish whether this patient has got an inflammatory state, yes or no. And here you'll note that they divide these patients, whether they are younger than 65 or older than 65. So in, in younger patients or patients younger than 65, the ferritin should be less than 30 to diagnose iron deficiency iron deficiency without anemia, whereas in older patients, they sort of make it gray and they say up until 100, um, especially if they're older than 65 um, with inflammatory diseases. And in those patients, you should make the diagnosis of iron deficiency. Then for iron deficiency anemia, again, um, so now the, uh, the HP is low and if the um, CRP is raised or the ESR is raised, then we, we're looking at making a diagnosis of iron deficiency anemia plus inflammatory conditions. Um, and there you, you would consider that even if the ferritin is more than 100. And if you look at the ESC guidelines for heart failure, there sometimes the target is even a ferritin of 300 if you've got inflammation as well. So we need to um, familiarize ourselves with these guidelines and not be so overly reliant on um, a laboratory marker that says, you know, the ferritin is 17, therefore it's not anemic. Because according to this, even if I was young and healthy, um, okay, well, 17 was a bad example because it's a flow diagram, yes, it's 15. But um, the, not that I support that. I think that we need to, at very least, need to make that cut off 13. So this is a very nice article that I liked a lot. And it was also published, I think, yeah, it was published this year. So it's called the Evaluation and Management of Anemia in the Older Adults. And this is also um, an open access journal that you can find. And, and here they talk about, so in the patient who has got an HP of less than 12, if it's a woman or less than 13 as a man, the, you need to start with what they call the the easily treatable causes. So look for iron deficiency, B12 deficiency, folic acid deficiency, and, and hypo or hyperthyroidism. So those are what they call the easy 
um, treatable causes, and they, um, if the iron or ferritin is less than 50, so, um, so this is what the American Society of Hematology recommends, ferritin of less than 50, I need to treat this patient with um, oral iron, or if they don't tolerate it, you can go to parenteral iron. Then, um, if the, so there's, the flow diagram is a little bit more complicated, but remember, this is not only for iron deficiency, like the other two flow diagrams. This is, this is quite a nice practical one, and looking at the other causes of anemia as well. And, you know, so I'm, I've just highlighted with the two red blocks of where iron deficiency fits in. So if um, I've got an inflammatory disorder like rheumatoid arthritis, and the ferritin is between um, 50 to 100, and the transferrin saturation is less than 20%, then this is anemia of chronic um, inflammation. And, and for, for some of these patients, they, they, they will need um, iron, def, you know, iron replacement therapy as well. And then I've just put this little red flag here, just to remind you, right in the beginning, we spoke about pancytopenia. So these are the patients that I must not just focus only on the iron. So if the MCV is high, if I've got other cytopenias, any family history of blood um, cancers, any dysplasia or blasts on the smear, that patient needs a bone marrow. But interestingly, um, here they've put a red flag if the HP is less than nine, that that patient needs a bone marrow as well. I'm not sure how I feel about that. And perhaps um, uh, I'd be a little bit more, but I mean, who might just speak against the um, American Society of Hematology, but I might have a little bit more of a watch and wait if, if they um, if if I knew the patient of iron deficiency, for instance, or I've got an a worsening unexplained anemia, so that patient definitely needs um, sort of more urgent intervention. Um, I'm not going to speak about this, but this is just um, looking at the different ferritins that we could use as cutoffs, and just showing that. Yeah, but I'm not going to go into that right now. So these, um, when you get the slides, and Adele, I'm quite happy to make this um, pack of slides available as a PDF as well. Um, I'll fix that spelling typo. Um, but but the, I quite like this flow diagram for what I should do if this patient has got iron deficiency. Um, so the first is that I need to look and take a proper history that I can establish the etiology. Then the next step is that I must start iron replacement therapy unless this um, patient needs an urgent colonoscopy because then we don't want the iron in the gut right then. But at the same time, we need to then look for other causes of iron deficiency. Do a urine analysis, look for the celiac disease, serology, do fecal immunochemical testing, helicobacter pylori, gynae consult if there's any history of abnormal uterine bleeding or heavy menstrual bleeding, and then do an upper and lower endoscopy in, in some patients, like, for instance, those that are um, uh, that are fit positive um, or else fit negative men or postmenopausal women with um, um, deficiency anemia. So those patients need um, endoscopy. And here they um, say in, in the article that if the patient is really old and poor functional status, that perhaps you could do a CT colonoscopy rather um, but, but you know, that, that, that one must be practical about. And then I've just said here, for how, I, how would I treat this patient? I treat this patient for six months, three to treat the anemia, three to replenish the, the stores. And this is if I was doing it orally. The duration also depends on the cause. So if I've got chronic, um, you know, blood loss, then, you know, you, the, the, then I'm, I can't say that I'm going to have a finite treatment of six months. Um, obviously, I'd want to treat that underlying cause very urgently as well. But for some older patients, they might have selected or elected to have a palliative care route. And those patients then might need to have treatment for longer. I need to make sure I give enough iron. Um, and here, I think that one needs to rather start low and go slow. So, so start with one tablet a day, see how it goes. If I need more than one tablet a day to make up the, the, the recommended milligrams of elemental iron, don't divide the doses. Remember, we want to keep the treatment um, simple, but also we want to have optimal absorption. So if, I, if you're going to give two tablets a day, give them both at the same time. Monitor the response to therapy. I can't overstate that. Don't just put this patient on iron. You need to see how this patient responds. And if that iron is not responding, 
um, then then those patients need to have um, additional workup and, and you need to go and see what's going on there. Monitor for um, treatment-related adverse events. So in summary, um, the prevention, diagnosis, and management of iron deficiency should form part of the routine care of older patients. There's guidelines that say that we should be screening for it. We can't argue against a good guideline that is, that is data-driven. Um, the management of iron deficiency in older patients really must be guided by comorbidities as well as patient preferences. And remember that there are times that oral iron is not your, your um, go-to and that there are patients that parenteral iron will be the better option. Don't forget or minimize minor complaints and, and ask about that. And, and this should be an important consideration when you're selecting an iron um, therapy, you know, an oral iron therapy. Remember, um, frailty is an inflammatory condition. We want good absorption. So please try and select an iron that, that is going to absorb um, independent of your raised hepcidin. The first therapy for iron deficiency in older patients is usually oral iron, and we need to aim for a decent dosage range. So just to summarize, remember to screen for iron deficiency in patients with cognitive impairment. We're going to screen for it in all of them, but especially those um, with, with cognitive impairment. Iron deficiency is not a diagnosis. We need to investigate and treat it. It's an important factor an extremely important factor in impaired mobility and frailty. We must consider polypharmacy drug interactions. We need to discuss dosage, frequency, and timing of oral therapy and make sure that your patients understand that well. And most importantly, in the older patient, iron deficiency plays a critical role in quality of life and we should um, honor and respect our patients and offer them something that will improve their quality of life. So thank you very, very much. And I'm sure that Adele will um, take us nicely through the question and answer session now. Dr. T, once again, thank you so much for sharing a remarkable presentation with us. Yes, so there are a couple of questions. Um, I am going to start reading them out. So one from Leslie is asking, how does one distinguish between iron deficiency anemia and, and anemia of chronic disease, especially in elderly patients with chronic respiratory disease, the role of soluble transferrin receptors in such a complex case? Yeah, so I must say I'm, I'm a little bit off soluble transferrin receptor at the moment. And, and Yes, I think that this is definitely a place for, for soluble transferrin receptor because it, it does help you to tease it out. The problem with soluble transferrin receptors, A, it's, it's not offered in the state sector. B, if it's in the private sector, the turnaround time is, in, in my experience, is really, really long. So it, it sort of doesn't, it's not really acutely helpful to, to decide what to do. Um, so I've sort of cooled off on soluble transferrin receptor for now. And for now, I'd rather look at, at what, what are the comorbidities. So, I mean, already we know that we're looking at different iron um, targets for patients who've got chronic kidney disease. We're looking for different iron targets for patients with, with heart failure. And, you know, and, and so if there's a condition that with like, for instance, with heart failure, where if I've got inflammation and my ferritin is less than 300, I'm going, and my transfer and saturation is less than 20%. And I think we often forget about the transfer and saturation. So my transfer and saturation is less than 20% and my ferritin is less than whatever this disease-specific cutoff is, then, you know, that makes it a little bit easier. If it's a, a, a condition that, and I'm not aware of um, something with, with, with con chronic respiratory conditions, then I'd keep my cutoff to being a ferritin of 100. Um, so I, I'd look at... Ferritin of less than 100 with a transfer and saturation of less than 20% and some evidence of inflammation, so either raised ESR or raised CRP, then I'd aim for a ferritin cutoff of 100 rather than 50. So I, I hope that answers your question. Okay, then moving on to the next question is what, what HB is called anemia in the elderly? So I'm not so, sure. That, oh. 
Yeah. So if you look at, um, so there's this article that we, we looked at the, I'm just going to quickly go here. So here in the older adult, they still use the exact same hemoglobin. So hemoglobin of less than 12 for women and less than 13 for men. So they, you know, so and and this comes back to this argument. Yes, your HP drops when you're getting older, but it doesn't mean I should accept it as normal. So the same cutoff, in other words, for for other adults. Then moving on to our next question is the role of favor B ninety in anemia, and how common is this in causing sudden onset anemia, for example? Oh, um, I've seen one case um, of that uh, and I have never seen it again. So I, I would say just in my, my little baby experience, it's it's uncommon. But I suppose it also depends on, you know, I mean, who's eating fava beans. We, <laughs> I've never had a fava bean in my life, but perhaps one needs to actually ask the patients. And, you know, whether they've had said fava beans, but it's not something that is sort of part of our normal cuisine. So I think it is actually quite uncommon, but it's not, it's not unheard of. And so, so it does happen, but uncommonly in my, in, in, in my context. And there is a question from Yolani, Yolani, yeah, Yolani Swanepoel. Is pancytopenia is decreased platelet count, decreased HB, and neutropenia? Not necessarily decreased WCC, as mentioned. That's true. More common than Yeah, so so you you are right. It, it, it's a de the definition is is correct. So you you're looking at a neutropenia. Um, for your for your for your diagnosis of a pancytopenia. In the next question, is there an, an association between iron deficiency anemia and D dimer levels? Sure, that I didn't come across that at all. Um, and perhaps Adele, that's one of the questions that we can put on our, you know, to look at box. Um, but I haven't seen anything like that. But I didn't look specifically for that. So I'll do a search after this and have a look. No problem. Do we still categorize iron deficiency as macrocytic and B12 and folate deficiency as macrocytic anemia? Yeah, so, so this is one of those historic things that I believe is overplayed and I believe that it actually results in a delay in the diagnosis of iron deficiency. So yes, I mean, even, um, you know, many of the flow charts that are created today will speak about, um, you know, a small MCV, you know, think about iron deficiency and a big MCV, you know, and older people think about yes. myelodysplastic syndrome, B12 or folate deficiency. It's it's true that, you know, it's it's a very practical way to look at it. But by the time my red cell indices have changed in the context of iron deficiency, I've actually got such late iron deficiency that my other features, you know, I mean, even if we just look at today, what we spoke about in the older patients, the sarcopenia, those other features, you know, the, the mobility, the depression, the, the, you know, cognitive function might already be well established, but, and, but my MCV might not have fallen. So yes, it's, it's a practical way to look at it. And many people, you know, sort of still hang on to it, but, more and more, I mean, especially if we're thinking about screening for patients for iron deficiency and not only thinking about iron deficiency once I'm anemic, then I think that that is, becomes a very, very arbitrary cutoff. And I don't actually like it at all. And you can see here, I mean, in this, this, this specific one that we've got on the screen at the moment, that they they say that you should have a look at, at at this, you know, that you should look at the MCV and the FBC and all of these things. But they don't specifically say MCV small, screen for iron deficiency, MCV big, look for B12 and folate deficiency and, and, and hypothyroidism. You know, it, those four generally come as a group. 
So my, uh, uh, these are my easy, easy to treat causes and I'm going to screen for all of them, even in the anemic patient. Because remember, for many patients, you've got a multiple, it, it is possible that I've got an iron deficiency as well as a folate deficiency. And which would then, you know, so I've, I've got one thing making small cells, one thing making big cells. And in the, so these, this patient might end up with a normal chromic normocytic anemia or just, you know, that is, you know, so I'm going to miss it if I'm only going to wait to be triggered by a low MCV or a big MCV. So practically, yes, if the MCV is low, you're, you've got quite a good chance that it's iron deficiency. But would I screen a patient with a normal MCV for iron deficiency if that patient is anemic? For sure. Okay, and then we have a second last question is, have you noticed any link between iron deficiency and dental abnormalities, example, loss of teeth and effect of diet? So, yes, um, actually, that's that's something that's quite fascinating. So, um, so iron deficiency is definitely associated with dental abnormalities. Um, so there are studies that have been done, not that I'm aware of any locally, but and, and not specifically that I've looked at for older people, but I know that in children, um, children with sort of extraordinarily bad dental caries, there have been studies where they've looked at iron status in those kids, and those kids have been iron deficient with or without anemia. So most certainly, and, and perhaps it's also something, Adele, that we can put on our list of things that I'll look at is in older patients and, and an association between you know, dental outcomes and iron deficiency, because that, that also, especially in older people, plays a big role in in the um, diet. And, you know, once they have got bad teeth, they're not eating well. And, you know, this also feeds into this whole cycle of sort of morbidity or quality of life um, with older people. Okay, perfect. So I think that is all for tonight from a question perspective we've gone through all of them if there's anybody else that still do have questions please make use of the email address that's provided in the chat box and you're more than welcome to email your questions to that email address and we will relay those questions to dr claire and then we will get back to you with the answer as well as the additional ones that you've mentioned dr claire and um well that brings us to the close um of our session for tonight. Um, as we mentioned earlier, please remember the 10 multiple choice choice questions that are available in the set, second link that was posted in the chat box earlier for those who would like to complete the questionnaire now immediately. And then on behalf of ANOVA, um, thank you so much again, Dr. Clee, for a very, very informative talk and sharing your knowledge with us. And thank you so much to all our attended guests. Um, then we look forward to our next event, which will be the last event for 2024 in this Iron Masterclass series. And that will be on Iron Reimagines a Masterclass in Gastroenterological Wellness, which will take place on the 5th of December 2024. And that will be presented by Dr. Wayne Simmons, who is a medical gastroenterologist in the Department of Internal Medicine at the Health Science Faculty of the University of Free State. And that brings us to the end. Have a lovely rest of the evening to everyone. And once again, thank you so much for attending.